Hello, and welcome to Union Tabernacle. We are so excited that you are joining us in our virtual environment today. If you haven't done so already, please like our Facebook page so that you will receive a notification when we go live. Also, share this worship service and tag your friends and family so that they can join you for worship. You can also follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We love to connect with you here at UTAB. So in the comments section, go ahead and tell us where you're watching from and who's watching with you. Before service starts, we want you to know what type of church we are. Our mission is to impact the community and the world with cross-centered ministry. We do that by meeting the needs of others through outreach and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are a purpose-driven church built on the five purposes of ministry, evangelism, discipleship, worship, and fellowship. We place great value in the next generation, and we are a church that loves to give. Welcome to UTAB. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, UTAB. Come on, isn't it good to be back in the presence of God? Let's just go ahead and give him thanks, honor, and glory, and thank him for being our friend. Thank him for walking with us and talking with us and keeping us. Every day with him is sweeter, so we just want to sing about God being our friend. Hallelujah. He's a friend like no other. loving me that you hear me when I call hallelujah and is it true that 
you are thinking of me, how you love me. It's amazing. Let's say that again. You guys can sing it with me. Who am I that you are mine for loving me? That you hear me when I call. Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? Come on and lift up your hands in this place today. Let us give God the praise that is due his name. I don't know about you, but I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was excited at the invitation to enter once again into the sanctuary and lift up the Lord our God to lift up my voice with praise, to lift up my hands and glorify him. I don't know about you, but I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble will hear thereof and be glad. 
So magnify the Lord with me. Come on, you sitting there on your couch. Stand up on your feet right now and lift up the Lord with me. Let us magnify his name together because the Lord our God, he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised. Come on, open up your mouth. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye land. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures through all generations. Eternal and great God, our Father, we thank you right now for once again granting us this precious privilege to enter into worship together, whether here in the sanctuary or virtually at home. We enter into worship to lift and magnify your name because there is nobody like you. Right now, Lord, we ask that you show up in this place. We pray right now for our pastor as he stands to proclaim your gospel, that your word would go forth and do exactly what you set it out to do. We ask, Lord, that it changes hearts, that it lifts up the bow down head, that it mends the heart of the brokenhearted, Father. We pray right now that you would do these things for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It is so glad, it's so good to be in worship again, once again. We want to take this time to welcome you online into this worship service. We are so glad that you've decided to hang out with us today. And it is our prayer that something is said or done that will greatly enrich your life and bring you to a closer, more meaningful walk with the Lord our God, and your fellow man. We are committed. Our pastor has been preaching sermons to help us to refocus on the gospel. And we pray that this word impacts your life today. So while you're worshiping with us online, we simply ask that you be, feel free to drop a line in the comment section, that you like this post, that you even share it with your friends so that they too may receive the goodness of the Lord today through the preached word. So we ask that while you're there in your home, go ahead and stand on your feet. Clap your hands, open up your mouth, and give God praise to the best of your ability. We pray that as we get ready to move forward in this worship service, that you will join in with us as we lift up our God. So right now, we're getting ready to go into praise and worship. Before our, And the next voice that you hear from this preaching place will be that of our pastor, Pastor Walter Carter III. Once again, we welcome you to this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If God has just been good to you, you can just go ahead and lift your hands and just begin to worship him. Hallelujah. And thank him for everything that he's given us and gifted us, even in this season, even in a pandemic. Hallelujah. There are so many things to still be grateful for. Hallelujah. So we owe him nothing less than to do everything for his glory. Hallelujah. And all that he has given and blessed us with, we can give it back to him. Hallelujah. Lord, if I find favor in your sight, then Lord, please hear my heart's cry. I'm desperately waiting to be I'll cross the hottest desert, I'll travel near or far, for your glory, I will do anything, just to see. Thank you. 
Come on, just let that be your prayer. Lord, if I find favor in your sight, then Lord, please hear my heart's cry. I'm desperately waiting to be where you are, and I'll cross the hottest desert. Yes, I will. I travel near or far for your glory. I will do anything just to see you. Yeah, to be told you as my King for your glory. See you. 
your presence. Oh, so we gotta be where we need to be where we wanna be where you are. We gotta be where you are. We wanna be where we gotta be where we wanna be where you are. Gotta be. Bless your name, God. Hallelujah. We'll stay in your presence, yeah. Excellent is your name in all the earth. From the place where the sun rises to the place where it goes down, Lord, your name is worthy to be praised. There is nobody like you. In fact, in the antiquity of our elders, we confess, can't nobody do me like you can. God, we love you and thank you for this another opportunity to look together into your word. We pray that as we open the scriptures that you would open our understanding. Help us, oh God, to clearly know what your word says, what your word means, and most importantly, how it applies to our lives. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And then use me for your glory and our good is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. For your glory, I will do anything. I want to invite your attention back to the book of Galatians as we continue our sermonic series entitled Refocused on the Gospel. We have been sermonically strolling now for several weeks and we've arrived at a rather critical portion of scripture. I believe that this is the hinge paragraph in the book of Galatians, it's all important doctrine has been alluded to, but here it will be plainly stated. I would that you would read the entire second chapter of Galatians as it constitutes the context here that we shall attempt to teach and preach. But I'm going to read into your hearing the last paragraph here. Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. <clears throat> and it reads it on this wise. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. 
But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if we rebuild what I, if, for if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. I want to lay with the message as you take your seats, no other way. Why don't you shout through your mask and say, there is no other way. I have a confession this morning. Those of you who have ridden in the car with me know this to be true. I hate traffic jams. I hate it so much that I will go out of my way to avoid possible traffic. Well, this irritation was heightened some years ago as I was in the city of Atlanta, Georgia. I was there for a college party at College Park. I had been given permission by my parents and the parents of my cousin and her friends to take them to this college party at College Park. Because I thought I knew the way, I jumped on the expressway in Atlanta. And if you've ever been there, you know this city has the worst traffic in the world. In my opinion, worse than New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago put together, especially when you fill the city with teenage drivers. Well, we were on the expressway and we were headed to College Park, and a traffic jam ensued. And when I say it was a traffic jam, you don't understand. It, it was at least a seven-mile jam where the traffic was stopped for hours without moving an inch. I got out of the car, and I went to try to search out someone who was familiar with the city so that I could find another way, which I, would, well, I was told by someone who was from Atlanta with a smile on their face, almost a chuckle in their voice, saying, if you're going to College Park and you're on the expressway, there is no other way. You have to take this expressway all the way until you get to College Park. I got out of the car and just started walking. It was a five and a half to six mile walk from where I was to where the party was, and everybody in Atlanta seemed to be on the expressway partying in the street. With all the people that were in town, the event, the traffic was worse than I had ever seen. This officer laughed at me. Evidently, in our text, Peter, Barnabas, and those from the James group that Paul has confronted last week in chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, these Jewish Christians also must have resented the traffic jam that was caused by God's gracious accepting of Jews and Gentiles on the basis of faith in Christ alone apart from works of the law. They were looking for an 
alternate route to get right with God. They wanted to make those who wanted to get right standing with God to keep the law. They needed to be circumcised. They needed to keep the Jewish kosher diet. They needed to do all of these things in order to get right with God. And here in this section, Paul, in no uncertain terms, lays out the argument that there just is no other way. Well, this is what I stood to tell you this morning as you are at home. I would would offer you this. Get a pen and write this down. Righteousness, that is, a right standing before God is not attained by what we do, but by what Jesus has already done. Oh yeah, that's a good word for somebody that needs to hear it, so let me play it again. Righteousness or a right standing with God is not attained by what we do, but by what Jesus has already done. The text breaks down in four sections. I will explain them to you as we move forward. But first, Paul says that there is no other way through a doctrinal reminder. Verses 15 and 16 constitutes this reminder that Paul feels as if it's necessary for him to tell those who would otherwise oppose him. You see, the gospel, as accepted by everybody who he was talking to, let's re re rehearse the fact that Paul is addressing a group of people, particularly Peter and Barnabas and those from the James group, in public. And everybody in the setting agreed that the gospel was through faith in Jesus Christ. That a person is set right before God or justified on the basis of Christ's faithfulness and not our own. His atoning sacrifice, he died in our place in order that we would be made right with God. In developing this particular argument, Paul first aligns himself with Peter and by implication the Judaizers in the doctrine that all believers, particularly Jewish believers, knew to be true. Namely, that a person's justification rests on the faithful obedience of Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ is not what saves you. It's the faithfulness of Jesus Christ that saves you. So when it comes to the issue of salvation, Peter, the apostles, these Judaizers, and all the Jewish believers, accept in principle of the belief that their salvation rests exclusively in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and not through works of the law or through the works of the flesh. Peter and Paul both were Jews by birth, yet they knew very well that they were not considered right before God or justified by works of the law. We know that we, even though we grew up, he says to Peter, as observant Jews are considered right before God. Only by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We are not justified by works of the law. This is what Paul considers justification. It's, it's the first mention of Paul of this particular word, justification, in the letter to the Galatians. It is a legal concept. The person who is justified is the one who gets the verdict in a court of law. Used in a religious sense, it means getting a favorable verdict before God on judgment day. I want to make sure that before we leave today that you understand the significance of being declared righteous by God. What 
is justification. Justification is an act of God whereby he declares a believing sinner righteous through the work of Jesus Christ. Every word of the definition is important. Justification is an act and not a process. No Christian is more justified than another Christian, having therefore been once and for all justified by faith, we have peace with God. Since we are justified by faith, it is an instant and immediate transaction between the believing sinner and God. If we were justified by works, it would be a gradual process. Furthermore, Justification is God's doing. It is not the result of our good deeds or works. It is God, Romans 8 and 33 says, that justifies. It is not by the doing of anything that the law required. There were 613 different laws uh, that, that the Jews would have to keep to the letter and no one was capable of doing it anyway and they were certainly not going to be made righteous by their own effort but they were declared righteous because of the work of the Lord. In justification God declared them righteous. He does not make uh, you righteous. Of course, real justification here leads to a real trust in Jesus Christ and a changed life, which is what James chapter 2 is really saying. He's saying that because you've been saved, it shows up in how you behave. Before the sinner trusts Jesus Christ, he is guilty before God. But the moment he trusts God, He's declared not guilty. and He can be never brought up on those charges again. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. This is great news that if you have confessed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you're not innocent, but you're not guilty. Lord Jesus. That, that, that although you, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, our sins have been put on Jesus. He died in order to pay for those sins, and so we're not guilty. It's, it's the legal term double jeopardy. The double jeopardy is... The Fifth Amendment to the Constitution suggests that no person can be tried for the same crime twice. And I know you're sitting there looking at me funny on Facebook saying, but I haven't been brought up on any charges, but you're mistaken. Every day, the accuser of the brethren brings you up on charges. And, and, and Jesus has to stand as your advocate and say, Your Honor, I object. He said, and what, on, on what basis? He would object on the basis of double jeopardy. He says, I've already been convicted of their crimes. They have to go free, not because they are innocent, but because I've already paid for their sins. And if you accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, let me tell you this. You're not guilty. Which means that you have been declared righteous. Not that you have behaved righteously, but you've been declared in a right standing before God. And so Paul wants to remind them as they have chosen to lean on the law and separate themselves from the fellowship of Gentiles, suggesting that the Gentiles needed to perform certain religious acts in order to be Christian, Paul is in no uncertain terms, says, hey, we already agreed on this 
doctrine earlier in this same chapter. Paul has already laid it out and he brought Titus with him, an uncircumcised Gentile, and they did not require him to be circumcised. And so Paul is reminding them of this all-important doctrine of justification. It's significant to them and to us that you are made righteous not because of your activities but because of what Jesus has done. But it gets better. Not only does Paul say there's no other way by reminding them of this important doctrine but there's no other way. Verse 17 and 18 says because of his deliberate response. Paul is, is masterful as he lays this argument out. Paul now deals with an a, uh, objection that he anticipated that someone had or could have had. Maybe the certain men from James would bring this up. It, it, it's important to remember that Paul made this statement publicly as we learned last Sunday with the concerned parties right in front of him. On one side of the room were the certain men from James who believed that God would not accept Gentiles unless they themselves were under the law of Moses and obeyed that covenant. Peter sat with these men and so did Paul's friend Barnabas. In fact, all of the Christians who were present seemingly agreed with this position because no one spoke up except for Paul. Jerusalem, in fact, all the Jerusalem Christians believed that the Gentiles in the church at Antioch were really saved, weren't really saved at all. In a real life setting, Paul couldn't just speak his mind without having to address some of the expected objections from his hearers. And these men must have had some objections because they, they seem, Paul seems to address an objection that we don't hear. And he, he, he proposes this, this, this situation. Here, let me read it for you. But if in our endeavor, verse 17 says, to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners. Is Christ then a servant of sin? Is Christ ordaining or endorsing your sinful activities or actions? Paul goes on to say, you got to be kidding me. That's the soup uh, in a national version. You, you got to be kidding me. He says, certainly not. As a man from Jerusalem, as these men from Jerusalem saw it, the idea that we are made right before God by faith in Jesus alone was unbelievable. After all, Christians still struggled with sin. Every day they sin, and how could they have been accepted by God and they still sin every day. In their thinking, this made Jesus a minister of sin. Because Jesus, Jesus' work of making them right with God must not have worked. <laughs> it may not, must not have made them right enough. Listen, if God justifies bad people, what point is it in being good? I know I'm messing with your theology right now because many of us think that when we, now to be clear, you should sin less. We'll get to that in a minute. But the truth of the matter is that no matter how hard you try, every day the Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one is without sin. And their suggestion, Paul anticipates, was that because they still sin, they could not possibly be right with God. Paul says, 
Certainly not. He, he says, you got to be kidding me. Are you serious? Jesus does not endorse or minister to sin. Paul's response was deliberate. First, we seek to be justified, he says, in Christ alone and not by Jesus plus our own good behavior. Second, we ourselves also are found to be sinners. That is, we acknowledge that we, we, that we still sin even though we're justified by Christ. But no, this certainly does not make Jesus the author or approver or minister of sin in our lives. He is not a minister of sin. Lord have mercy. Jesus died for our sins. He is not an endorser or minister of them. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is not a minister of sin. He has sacrificed his life for sin. Well, if I build again those things which I destroyed, Paul argues, I make myself a transgressor. Boy, Paul is masterful here. He answers in a subtle yet brilliant way. If he were to build again a way to God through keeping the law of Moses, then he would make himself a transgressor. Essentially, Paul was saying, there is more sin in trying to find acceptance before God in keeping the law or any other activity than it is in everyday life as a Christian. These men from James, we assume, thought they had to hang on to the law for themselves and they wanted to make others subject to it. So there wouldn't be so much sin. What Paul shows is that by putting themselves under the law again, they were sinning worse than ever before. How is it a sin to build again another way to God? In many ways, perhaps the greatest is that it looks at Jesus hanging on the cross taking the punishment that we deserved, bearing the wrath of God's uh, anger on our behalf, and then they say, that's good, Jesus, but it ain't enough. Your work on the cross is good and all, but I need to do something else to save myself. Lord have mercy. I wish I wish I could I wish I could holler like I feel it. If you could save yourself, then you don't need Jesus. This is an insult to the Son of God who obeyed the will of the Father even unto the point of death. To, to suggest that his obedient sacrifice was insufficient in and of itself is the worst sin of all times. Here is a man who's dying for us, and your actions and your attitudes suggest that it wasn't enough. Lord, have mercy is right. So Paul's deliberate response here addresses the objections of his naysayers. He, he, is, he is in front of their face and he is telling them straight out, listen, there is no other way. He says it really doesn't even make sense for you to suggest that you need to add something to the pure blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it, but it still gets just a little bit better. Not, not, only, not only does Paul give a deliberate response, but now he moves in verses 19 and 20. I'm almost done, Jacob. To uh, describe his relationship to the law. Listen to me read the Bible to you. For I, though the law, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God, I have been 
crucified, here it is, with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here, Paul says, I, 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 live, I died to the law. <laughs> He says, I, I, I died to the law. Paul made a bold statement here saying that he had died to the law. If he was dead to the law, then it was impossible for the law to be the way that he stood accepted by God. Notice that it wasn't the law that was dead. The law reflects in its context, the hardened character of Almighty God. There was nothing wrong with the law. It was the law. It wasn't the law that died. It was Paul that died to the law or its requirements. Are y'all with me now? How did Paul die to the law? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked. He said, I threw the law, died to the law. The law itself is what killed Paul. It showed him that he never could live up to the law and fulfill its holy standard. For a long time before Paul met Jesus, he thought God would accept him because of his ability to keep the law. But he came to the point where he really understood the law, that the law is there to reveal our sinfulness and to tell us what God doesn't want us to do. It does not save you. It does not change you. So Paul says, I, I died to that. Paul realized that the law made him guilty before God, not justified. This was a, a sense of guilt before God that killed Paul and made him see that keeping the law could not be the answer. If a man is justified by works of the law, then why Jesus have to die? His death, his burial, his resurrection are the truth of the gospel and its power to save. We are saved, hear me now, by faith in Jesus Christ. He died for us. And we live by faith. He lives within us. Lord have mercy. That's, that's a shouting spot right there. Listen, the reason that we are alive is because Jesus is living on the inside of us. We are so identified with Christ by the Spirit that we died, Romans chapter 6, with him. That means that we are dead to the law. To go back to that which we've died to is foolishness. It is to, to climb out of the casket and come back to serve that which killed you in the first place. To go back to Moses is a return to the graveyard. We have been raised to walk in the newness of life. And since we live by his resurrection power, we do not need the law to help us get right with God. Let me make sure I'm very practical in this statement and make this point clear in light of this gospel truth concerning grace. Just because you are saved won't make you sinless. But because you have been saved, it ought to make you sin less. Don't use God's sufficient grace as a license to sin because Paul has already told us that he is no minister of sin. Let me read you what he said to the Roman church in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, Paul says. How can we who died to sin still live in it? 
Do you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in his death, we shall certainly be united with him in his resurrection. Listen, let me tell you this. If you died to, to the law and to sin with Jesus, then you ought to be resurrected and walking in the newness of life. Next week, we will, do, we will deal with the behavior that ought to follow this conviction. But for now, you need to make sure that you are rooted in the conviction that there is no other way to be made right with God than through the work of Jesus Christ. But Paul closes in verse 21 with a detrimental reason. If you're tracking with me, Paul opens with a doctrinal reminder. He has now made it from the doctrinal reminder to a detrimental reason. Listen, let me tell you what he says here in this closing verse of this wonderful book. He says, uh, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no reason. <laughs> It, it, it's detrimental because Paul says, I don't want to uh, nullify what Jesus has done. Mm. He, he says, the Judaizers want to mix law and grace, but Paul tells them that that's impossible. To go back to law means to set aside, nullify the grace of God. God has freely, lovingly, deliberately saved all of us through the work, by, through accepting the work of his son, Jesus Christ. For us to lay that aside is foolishness. Peter had experienced God's grace in his own salvation. He, had, he himself had let God down time and time again, and yet he's been saved by grace of God. He had proclaimed the grace of God in his own preaching ministry. But when he withdrew from these Gentile Christians, he openly denied the grace that he himself had received, Lord Jesus. He suggested by backing away from them that they needed to earn salvation. That he was earning salvation by keeping these ritualistic rules and laws. And I don't know who I'm preaching to, but there are some people that really believe that it is possible to lose your salvation. If you believe that you can earn it, you believe that you can unearn it. And I want to tell you that grace is a gift. You can't earn it, you don't deserve it, you could never pay it back. Grace says there is no difference. All are sinners and all can be saved if they would just confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But Peter's action said there is a difference. The grace of God is not sufficient. We also need the law in addition to to the blood. Wait a minute. The blood still works. Returning to the law, listen, nullifies the cross. It erases the cross. It removes its power. It's righteous. If righteousness came by the law, then Christ died for nothing. Law says do Grace says it's done. Law said you still got work to do. But Jesus on the cross said it is finished. Yes, he did. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God. Listen, I want to tell you this. There's no other way. I said there's no other way. 
Jesus in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane proves that there is no other way. Jesus looks down into the bitter cup and then he looks up to his father and says, if mm, there is another way, let this cup pass from me, Lord Jesus. But I want to tell you that, that he went on to say, nevertheless, not as thy will, but not as I will, but as thy will. And he went on to the cross. They, they nailed him to the tree. The Bible says, cursed is a man that hangeth on the tree. They, they buried him in a borrowed tomb. But early on Sunday morning, he got up with all power and authority in his hand. There's no other way. If there was another way, Jesus asked for it. And God never gave him an answer because there is no other way. And let me tell you this. I'm glad that Jesus would not come down from the cross. Lord Jesus, I'm, I, I didn't mean to go this far today. But I got to tell somebody that, that they, they dared him. If you be the Christ, come down and save yourself. But he decided to die just to save little old me. And I'm glad today that he loved me enough to die in my place. To take my punishment. That which was intended for me, Jesus took upon himself. And all you got to do is accept the gracious sacrificial gift of Jesus' death on the cross and you can be saved oh my goodness I'm thinking about Andre Crouch now he says I don't know why Jesus loved me I don't know why Jesus came I, I don't know why he sacrificed his life oh but I'm glad I'm glad he did he left his mighty throne in glory to bring to us redemption story. Oh, he died and he rose again just for you and me. Oh, come on, tell somebody. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm glad that there was no other way and that we had a Savior who was willing to mount that cross and pay our sins because we could never have been made right before God on our own accord. But Jesus, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but he washed it. He washed it white as snow. Listen, if you're looking for Jesus today, you're looking for salvation, you're looking to get right with God, Listen, you can stop looking. Jesus is right here to save you. He can change you and he can transform you. All you have to do is place your faith in his finished work. Because he's done enough to save us all. There is no other way. Righteousness, that is, right standing before God, is not attained by what you do, but by faith in what Jesus has already done. There is no other way. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your payment. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for giving to us what we don't deserve and keeping from us that which we do. I pray now, God, that the word was sufficient to save some lost sinner who is listening to this broadcast in need of your saving power in their own life. Help them, oh God, to say yes to you. Then I pray for some saint who is struggling 
trying to earn salvation or approval from God. Ease their burden and let them know that that which was necessary to satisfy our God has already been done. Pray it all in the strongest, certain name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, I'm just grateful that there is no other way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And yes, you too can have everlasting life today. And that's what we offer you. We offer you an opportunity to make Christ your personal Lord and Savior, to accept him in your heart. And how do you do this? You admit that you are a sinner. Believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, and you shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the penalty of sin, saved from the power of sin, and one day ultimately saved from the presence of sin. List in the comments below. Let us know that you've made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, or you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And someone from our hospitality ministry will get in contact with you to share with you and to welcome you into our family. Thank you so much. Student Bible study is every Tuesday at 6 p.m. This month, we are studying the lesson, Three Circles. This lesson prepares our students to evangelize and share the gospel. Let's make an impact. Bible study continues on Wednesday at 7 p.m. via Zoom in the UTAP main meeting room. Let's get reconnected and refocused. Sunday school starts at 9.15 via Zoom. The winter theme for this month is called in the New Testament. So grab your Bibles and let's get ready to dive into the Word. Now a special update from our women's ministry. Hi ladies, it's that time again. Our small group Bible study sessions will resume every third Saturday of the month, starting Saturday, February 20th at 10 a.m. Sisterhood Saturdays, doing life together. At the beginning of the pandemic, we used our small group sessions to stay connected and we found encouragement in the Word of God. This time will be no different. We're inviting all women from the young professional to the seasoned saint because no matter what season you're in, you will be able to find something to share within your individual small group. We are studying Master Life, The Disciples Cross. You can purchase your workbook at Amazon or any Christian book site. The information will be listed in GroupMe. So if you are not receiving messages from the women's ministry within GroupMe, just contact us and we'll make sure that you are a part of this Bible study. So grab your cup of coffee or tea, your laptop, and a copy of Master Life as we refocus. Sisters serving one God, learning new lessons, building new relationships while we do life together. See you there. The year 1837 was a great year for the African American community. During this time, is when the historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, were established. They were established to give African Americans a way, an affordable way to go to college and obtain an equal education. Some example of these universities include Spelman College of Atlanta, Georgia, Howard University of Washington, D.C., Xavier of Louisiana, Morehouse College of Atlanta, Georgia, Tuskegee uh, University of Tuskegee, Alabama, and Hampton University of Hampton, Virginia. Richard Humphrey, a silversmith and a philanthropist, 
established the oldest HBCU in America, Cheney University of Pennsylvania in the year 1837. HBCUs, or historically black colleges and or universities, are schools that ensure success in education of African Americans. These colleges were brought upon our race of people to ensure that we have a place of education where our culture was not only accepted, but praised. The first HBCU was founded in the year 1837. The old, oldest HBCU is located in Cheney, Pennsylvania. Since that time, there have been a wide stretch of HBCUs established all across the land of the United States of America. People that have attended HBCUs include Oprah Winfrey, Spike Lee, Samuel L. Jackson, Sean Combs, Erica Badu, and Common, as well as the newly elect Vice President Kamala Harris. This has been your weekly Black History Spotlight. God bless.